We could have 13 more specials and a lot of testimonies, but you know what? I don't know. I come for the preaching. Hallelujah. Amen. Anybody else? Amen. Anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. We, uh, I'm going to tell you something. From everything, from you ain't drunk as you're supposed to be, amen, to, to the messages that just grips your heart. And, and I, I'm going to say this. We've been honored to have great men in this area, you know, Brother Arnold, Brother Cornwell, Brother James, Sister Freeman, and, and many others. But every one of those people, even as different as they are and so great in the kingdom, they all, somehow you were interwoven into every conversation that we had. Amen, because I know you don't want to hear this because, you know, that's the kind of person you are, but you're an icon of Pentecost. And it's a privilege for Northeast Arkansas to have Brother Wayne Huntley to come <laughs> preach the gospel to us tonight. So why don't we stand to our feet and put our hands together for the King of kings and Lord of lords as his man of God comes to minister. Thank you, Thank you And everybody said praise the Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. A renowned speaker was in a particular pulpit getting ready to speak, and he was being introduced. And uh, the gentleman that introduced him meant well, and he kind of did what Brother Etheridge did, has done tonight, and that is get caught up in a spirit of exaggeration. And he kept carrying on about how great this speaker was and how wonderful and all this, and Delighted and incredible he was. And so as the speaker assumed the platform, he said this. He said, repentance is in order tonight. He said, first of all, the man that introduced me should repent for his spirit of exaggeration. And he said, I should repent for enjoying it. So repentance is in order here today. I do appreciate the kindness of my receptivity into your area. And uh, I don't know how to respond to such a glowing introduction other than to say that I'm just blessed to be a part of the family of God. I'm glad to be a Christian tonight. I'm glad to be a part of the United Pentecostal Church. I'm indebted to wonderful men of God in this movement, privileges, opportunities that far exceed my worthiness, such as even being here in Paragool tonight. I'm very thrilled to be here. And what a compliment to all of you that on a Friday night, this building is filled. That is wonderful. Give yourselves a hand. You know, a lot of folks today, they think that uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night is the only time we have church. But all of you are to be commended by making the effort that it took to be here in this house of the Lord and to worship God as so beautifully as you have done with a wonderful spirit of anticipation in the atmosphere to receive the word of the Lord so that we can all find our rightful posture and position to do what God wants us to do in these next few waning moments of our time here on earth. How many really believe that the next great spiritual event is rapture? And along with that, God wants us as Pentecostals, as apostolics, to have our minds right, our souls right, our spirits right, so that he can do his good work in these final, final moments. I'm honored to stand in this pulpit following guest speakers that have been here and of course giving the ultimate appreciation and compliment to the man that stands here week in and week out. Everybody ought to feel that their pastor is the greatest preacher in the world. And there's nothing to be more highly evaluated, appraised, or appreciated in this hour of vacillation, fluctuation, and faltering than a consistent, godly, 
spiritual pastor. Clap your hands and thank God for your pastor tonight, whoever he may be. He's been talking about being nervous about being around me today and being uneasy and uncomfortable. Kind of reminded me of a little story my son-in-law told in our church. He said when he was a child, his mother would get up and take them to school, and she would not properly dress for the day. She would just do whatever she, I see some witnessing going on up in here. I'm already connecting here. I feel a kindred spirit. Just pray you don't have a wreck. Some of these mothers get up, take these kids to school, and they got a house coat on, and their hair's everywhere. And uh, so Sister Battlestero got up to take her kids to school, and she just had a house coat on, her hair everywhere, and half awake, you know, and just trying to do what she got to do. And so she pulled up to a, 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 a traffic light in a bad part of town. And this man pulled up beside her in his car. And she got nervous about looking over there and seeing him because she was in a rough side of town. So she just leaned over. She was hoping he would not see her, but he saw her. She leaned over and locked her door. He was looking right at her when she did that. And while she was looking at him, he reached over and locked his door. If you think you don't want me in your car, I want you to know I don't want you in my car. So maybe he, I was making him nervous and he's making me nervous. Because whenever you get in front of people and you're built or advertised or built up to be something exceptional, they sit there and like, well, let's see what the old boy's got to offer here tonight. Well, if that's the case, you're going to be disappointed. Because I've not come to flatter you, but I've come to challenge you with what I believe God is wanting to say to the apostolic church right now. <laughs> Lovely facility here, and of course, no matter what the edifice looks like, the beauty of the church is the people that have been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. That's what makes the church beautiful. All you wonderful, lovely Pentecostals. And I am a strong proponent. Maybe it's because I am a grandfather. But my ministry a few years ago has changed and, and I really treasure and value children. And to see them worshiping God and praising God, don't ever discourage that. Don't ever discourage that. We need to raise a generation of children that will be hell's worst nightmare. So Brother Etheridge, it's my wonderful privilege to get to know you, spend some time with you, fellowship with you, and, and uh, enjoying it very, very much. There's no place I'd rather be in church. I'd rather be in church than anywhere else on earth. I don't mean to meddle here tonight, but I think Pentecost could use a revival of, I was glad when they said unto me. Don't ever let coming to church get old and boring. But let it stay alive and fresh and exciting. So thank you for the kind invitation, the privilege and joy to be with you tonight. I will preach from the platform upon which I am privileged to exercise ministry. And that is, I'm privileged to preach in large what they would call venues and small venues, meaning Great big meetings, uh, conferences of thousands, and, and yet I preach sometimes in churches of 30 and 40 and 50. So I've seen Pentecost in a personal and up-close way. And in my travels and experiences of being in and around the Apostolic Pentecostal Church, I will preach a message to you tonight that I feel is the most cardinal principle and revelation that the church needs right now. What I will preach to you tonight, if we can engraft it, if we can believe it, if we begin to talk about it, act upon it, and live it out, we will affect and impact our communities, our city, our state, our nation, and our world. How many really want to be a part of a worldwide 
revival. Clap your hands and bless the name of the Lord right now. I'm sure you would probably feel more comfortable if you stood for the reading of the scripture tonight in honor of the word. The book of Exodus chapter number 1 and we read beginning with verse number 5. Exodus chapter 1 and verse number 5. If you teach home Bible studies, if you teach search for truth, you're very familiar with these passages of Scripture. But recently the Lord has challenged my spirit with an understanding of them that I would like to share with you this evening. Exodus 1 and 5. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls. For Joseph was in Egypt already. Everybody say, 70 souls. And Joseph died and all his brethren in all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty and the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. I want you to hear what this Egyptian king said because I'm afraid many have read it and it has not yet seeped into the souls of our comprehension. Notice what this Egyptian king said. Thank you. He said the Israelites are more and they are mightier than we are. That was not an Israelite. It was not Joseph. It was not Moses. It was not one of the leaders of Israel. Matter of fact, you might say it was the adversary of the people of God. He said, folks, we better wake up. Because these people are more and they are mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also into our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. One other reference of this very same setting of Scripture is found in Psalm 105 and verse 24. This is what it says in the book of Psalms relative to the same time frame that I read previously. Psalm 105, 24. And he increased his people greatly and made them stronger than their enemies. He increased them and made them stronger than their enemies. And there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. I want to preach to you for a few minutes on this subject. A new concept for a new king. A new concept for a new king. Clap your hands and bless the name of the Lord with me right now, would you? Just before you sit down, I'll give you a little clue what we're going to preach about. Turn around to somebody and say, pray for me tonight. Because I need a healing. I need to be healed of my stinking thinking. And you may be seated. I need to be healed of my stinking thinking. I would like to address and identify the modern day spiritual chains taskmasters and cruel whips of the new millennium church. I am illustrating the fact that while in Egypt the Israelites suffered from chains, taskmasters, and whips. I will parallel the chains, the taskmasters, and the whips in application 
to the New Millennium Church tonight. They are three, and they are these. Number one, negative thinking. Number two, poor self-image. And number three, a slave mentality. I am convinced right now that the apostolic church is suffering from negative thinking, poor self-image, and a slave mentality. Two illustrations I will use. I cannot prove. I've only heard of them. The third one I can articulate with great confidence because I have experienced it. It is said that you can place fleas into a jar with a lid, and after a period of time, it is possible to remove the lid, and the fleas remain captive due to the adjustment of the height of their jump because there had been a ceiling placed upon them. You could literally unscrew the cap, take it off, and they will not endeavor to go any higher because they have adjusted their height of jump to a previous barrier. An elephant can be bound with a small rope, fettered and tethered as a youth. And if it's put there when he's but a child, it can remain there all of his life. Although he is gigantic, massive, and powerful, he will remain a captive held by a small cord, although he could snap at any moment, except for the fact that he has adjusted his length of travel by a little cord that used to hold him, but now could never begin to contain him. I also can tell you the story of how that it's possible to catch a few bass in the morning. Move your boat from place to place to the day, bringing those bass out of the water, replacing them at every new location. I've done this, and the first time I move them, I've been fishing and forget that I had fish on a stringer. They slapped the side of the boat, and I've just about jumped out of the boat. Terrified me. You, they will pull on that cord, and they will fight that stringer. But at the evening time when I've come to the shore, I've actually had a stringer full of fish to slip out of my hand and go into the water, thinking they would certainly be gone forever. But because they had pulled and come back, jerked and come back, all day long they had fought their resistance until finally they accommodated the distance they could move by a fetter that now was no longer there. They flowed on top of the water as though they were captive when really they were totally free. What I'm preaching tonight is this. Is it possible that that which once held us, once restricted us, and once limited us can be removed and we continue to live as though it was still in force? What I'm preaching is this. You know, I, I do a lot of flying and I heard it coming over here. I want you to know tonight, church, I have a message from our captain. He has removed the fasten seat belt sign, and we are now free to move about the cabin. I want to tell you, you are now free to be whatever you want to be. You are now free to do whatever you want to do. You are now free to go wherever you want to go. You are now free to have whatever you want in the spirit. I preach to you, you can win as many souls as you want to. You can pastor as big a church as you want to. You can have a greatest revival as you want to. Anything we can believe, anything we can imagine, our God is more than able to make it a reality. We need a new concept for a new king because our concepts will either be channels or chains. I need to define for you a concept. That's the way we think. It's the way we see things. It's the way we perceive it. Let me just pause long enough to say your church will never be viewed any greater in your community than you think it is. 
Your God will never be viewed any greater in your world than he's viewed through your eyes. I wish somebody would say, our God is great. Our church is great. We're having revival. And this is the greatest place in the world to be in the church serving God. I'm just going to say this and I'm going to move on. The problem with some apostolic Pentecostals is they try to get sinners to do what they won't do. I say they want new people to do what they won't do. If you want new folks to talk in tongues, maybe you need to try it. You want new folks to get excited, maybe you need to get excited. You want new folks to run the aisles, maybe you need to run the aisles. You want new converts to dance, maybe you need to dance. Let's not expect them to do what we won't do. I wish somebody would shout hallelujah. hallelujah. I'm going to say this and I'm going to move on because I'm going to preach nice tonight. I'm not going to be rough on folks. I'm not going to try to beat you up. I just want to inspire you. I don't want to expire you. I want to inspire you. But I'm feeling a spirit in Pentecost, apostolic movement. There's, now, I don't mean to be disrespectful because I got gray hair myself. And I got some age myself. But there's too many old-time Pentecostals frowning on the youth of the church today thinking that they're not doing what they ought to do while you do nothing. All they want to do is sit around and critique and condemn and judge. You need to get up and show them how to worship God. Show them how to have revival. Show them how to respond to the Spirit. Show them how to back the past. That's all I'm going to say about that. We're moving right along here. Our concepts will either be channels or chains. There'll be blockades or there'll be boulevards. There'll be weights or there'll be wings. We need a new concept for a new king. Now I will deliver to you what I consider to be the most sinister sins of the apostolic church in this hour. Here are our three greatest sins. Number one, little faith. When you got a God like we've got and you got little faith, that's major sin. Small vision. Little faith. Small vision. And low levels of satisfaction. I'm amazed at how little it takes to make some Pentecostals pacified and satisfied. If two people get the Holy Ghost, they think we've had Pentecost. Hey, if two can get it, 20 can get it. If 20 can get it, 200 can receive it. You need to thank God for what he's done, but get on your feet and say, I know you can do better. I know you can do greater. Somebody shout greater things. The Bible says there arose a new king that knew not Joseph. I pause to tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. The world may have looked at us one day kind of out of the side of their eyes. They may have looked at us kind of narrowly. They may have looked at us like a bunch of idiots and weird, wild fanatics. They may have looked at us at people that don't matter. But I want you to know that was then and this is now. If you could hear hell tonight, it's shaking and shivering because there's nothing the devil fears more than a one God, Jesus name, apostolic on fire church. The Bible said there arose a new king that knew not Joseph, indicating he had no association with Israel's past. He didn't know how they got there. He didn't know what they used to be. He saw them only as they were in the present. He didn't know them as 70 
fleeing fugitives, weak and small in number. He saw them as a force that needed to be dealt with. He saw them as a threat to his kingdom. Now fast your seatbelts for this one. I said there wasn't no more coming, but here's one more. Too many Pentecostals are trapped in a time warp. They see Pentecost only as it was and not as it is. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got the greatest preachers in the world. We've got the greatest churches in the world. We've got the greatest talent in the world. Turn around to somebody and say, it ain't that way anymore. It ain't that way anymore. It may have been that way, but it's not that way. As a matter of fact, it's amazing who's coming into the doors of the Pentecostal church right now. Folks that we thought never would receive the Holy Ghost are coming to our churches. People of power, people of prestige, people from every status of life. This is a new day, and we need a new concept. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. The challenge of the church today is that we boast and that we celebrate our revelation of the mighty God in Christ. While we desperately need a revelation of the mighty God in us. I'll say that again. We celebrate our revelation of the mighty God in Christ. But we need a revelation of the mighty God in us. We say it every once in a while, but we ought to live it. I say we ought to live it. Every morning when we get up, we ought to live it. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in the church than he that is in the world. Hell can't stop this church. It doesn't matter who the president is. They can't stop this church. It doesn't matter what the political world says. It can't stop this church. Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Turn around to somebody and say, the devil can't stop this. Sin can't stop this. And I want to say this, a few negative unbelievers can't stop this. All we need is two or three that will agree. Great is our God. Great is our God. Great is our God. I'm feeling something right now. <laughs> so I pause to know how much meddling I should do here tonight. And how much preaching I should do here tonight. I don't know y'all never been here before, so it's a free pulpit, right? I think there may be two or three people here trying to stop this. There may be two or three in the church somewhere, this one, one that's represented here, that's thinking you're going to stop it. I got news for you, bigger folks than you've tried to stop it. <laughs> Richer people than you have tried to stop it. More influential people than you have tried to stop it. Nobody can, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. I wish I had a fired up saint to give God some praise right now and let two or three folks know you're not gonna stop this. We're gonna grow. We're gonna have revival. We're gonna be blessed. Somebody shout yes. Paul's prayer is pertinent. And this is what he said. That the eyes of their understanding could be enlightened. 
it's possible to be in this church years and years and years and still not really see what it is. I'm preaching what I have experienced. See, I came out of a very small church in North Carolina. We have more people in our choir than I ever saw in our church the whole time I was being raised. We have a larger choir than our whole church was when I was being raised as a teenager and a young person in my home church. I say that to say this. You don't have to come out of a silver-plated, gold-infested, hand-fed, prioritized heritage to do something for God. You can have a greater revival than anybody in your family, in your history, or in your church has ever had. So I went to Texas Bible College. And while I was there, coming out of that small church, in the prayer room one day, it was like God peeled scales from my eyes. And said, hey, I want to show you what you are a part of. And he peeled the scales from my eyes. And all of a sudden, I saw how wonderful, magnificent, highly evaluated, greatest treasure on this earth I have been given. By being able to be in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I wish somebody would know that salvation is greater than a million dollars. I wish somebody would know for our kids to sing in a choir and play on this platform is greater than to be the MVP tonight at high school football game. I wish somebody would know there is nothing greater. You may be seated. Man, if you want to fire me up, let me tell you how to fire me up. All they got to do at home to get me really. I started saying anointed. I doubt that. Aggravated. Irritated. Upset. Is at home or anywhere just to say, well, we're just going to have church tonight. Just going to have church. I, I, I go crazy when I hear, well, we're just having church. Just having church. I wish somebody would get on the same page with me here to realize there is nothing more dynamic. There is nothing more powerful. There is nothing greater than apostolic Pentecostal church. Church can do what nothing else in this world can do. Church can heal. Church can deliver. Church can change. Paul said, I wish that you would open their eyes so they could understand. We need our eyes open tonight. So that we could see ourselves as angels see us. Everybody says angels see us. Gideon was down threshing a little wheat. He was hiding. And the angel came to him and said, you're a mighty man of valor. And Gideon's like, uh, wrong number. <laughs> Me? <laughs> you got the wrong guy here. The angel said, you are a mighty man of a valor. The problem with Pentecostals is we have a poor image of who we are. We are king's kids and live like paupers.
Let me show you how angels see us. And I borrow from my friend who's now deceased, Brother Alan Oggs. How many know Alan Oggs? He preached a sermon entitled one time, Gabriel, you're nothing but an angel. He said a lady came into his office. Her son was in trouble with the pastor. And she was trying to, to uh, mediate between her son and the pastor. And she said, but pastor, I got to tell you, my son is not an angel. And Brother Og said, I know that. And you need to thank God for that. Because angels can't be saved. Angels can't be blood washed. Angels can't be born again. And the Bible said of the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven of such the angels desire to look into. I've been fighting a sneeze for a while. I'm going to go and get it over with. I'm a little hot up here tonight. Turn to your neighbor and say, angels wish they had what you've got. Angels wish they had what we have. But angels will never have the Holy Ghost. We need to see ourselves as the enemy sees us. When that barley cake rolled into the enemy's camp, they said, I know what that is. That's the sword of the Lord and Gideon. We're dead, men. We're done. I wish somebody to realize if you could find the devil tonight, this is what he'd be saying. Hell help me, all heavens broke loose. As a matter of fact, one of the things that got Israel out of Egypt is the Egyptians came to Pharaoh and said, let these people go. Don't you know that if they stay here, we are but dead men. Get them out of here. I'd like for us to have such a Holy Ghost revival that the devil would start praying for the rapture. That the devil would start saying, I wish they'd go on, get out of here. They're closing down the drug dens. They're closing down the bars. They're delivering people. They're changing lives. I want you to know tonight the Bible says you're salt. The Bible says you're light. The Bible says you're a peculiar people. But that doesn't mean that you're weird or you're wacky. It means you are a rare, uncommon treasure. You're a royal nation. You're a chosen priesthood. I don't know when we're going to become like these kids. A few months ago, my five-year-old grandson got the Holy Ghost. Now, thank you. That's what we ought to do. We ought to celebrate it. And that's what we do. Now, you do what you want to do. Here's what we do. When my, my, my grandkids or my kids get the Holy Ghost, we celebrate. Nothing greater in the world. So Christian is five. He gets the Holy Ghost. We say, Christian, where do you want to go to celebrate your Holy Ghost baptism? Well, you know what kids are going to say. He wants to go to Chuck E. Cheese's. So the whole family gets together. We go to Chuck E. Cheese's. I buy him a Chuck E. Cheesey hat. He has a Chuck E. Cheese Holy Ghost birthday cake. When we come in, the lady at Chuck E. Cheese's says, well, you got a good number of people here. What are you celebrating? And before anybody could say anything, Christian, five years old, he steps up and he says, I got the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. He said, I've never done that before. And if a five-year-old is not a shame, how much more should the church not be ashamed? 
We talk in tongues. We see miracles. We dance in the spirit. We have victory in the Lord. We need to celebrate who we are and what we are. I want you to notice the description of Israel from the mouth of a king. Everybody say fruitful. Say increased abundantly. Say multiplied. Say the land is full of them. They are more and mightier than we are. When I went through the security this morning at the Raleigh-Durham airport, there were two men there that I had to go by to be screened, and both of them have had the Holy Ghost at our church. I remember being in Raleigh, and you couldn't find a Pentecostal with a search warrant. A while back, I was going somewhere to preach a camp meeting, and, and I was in an incredibly long security line. And it was obvious I was going to miss my flight. This gentleman came up to me, and he said, let me see your ticket. I, I, to this day, I don't know who he was. He, he worked for TSA, but I didn't, I didn't know him. He said, let me see your ticket. I handed it to him. He said, you're going to miss your flight. He said, I'll be right back. He went away, came back in a minute with a wheelchair. I don't, I don't know who he was. I didn't know that he knew me, but he said, Reverend, get in the wheelchair. I said, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm not getting in the wheelchair. I said, get in the wheelchair. I got in the wheelchair. He pushed me out of line. He took me to the elevator. He pushed the button. We went up to where the security was. He moved me to the head of the line and said, have a good day. The land is filled with them. I'll tell you one more I like better than that one. A few years ago, we had taken my nephew and his wife to a little Christmas show outside of Raleigh. Some singing and stuff about Christmas. We'd had a good meal that night. We were coming back about 11 o'clock. And we were just laughing and having a good time. It's right at Christmas. And we were having a wonderful time. We're in the Christmas spirit. When all of a sudden, poof, these blue lights. North Carolina, the, the lights of the police are blue. Some places they're red, in North Carolina they're blue. When the blue light special came on, poof. I didn't know where that guy came from, if I passed him, if he was on the side. We were talking, laughing, we were paying a bit of attention. He pulled me over. I said to my wife, I said, this has to be Scrooge. I said, here we are in the Christmas spirit. Scrooge is trying to steal my joy. In North Carolina you're taught when a patrolman pulls you over, the thing you do is put your hands on the steering wheel and wait till he tells you what to do. You know, they don't want you rumbling around. <laughs> what are you trying to do? <laughs> What's under your seat? They want to watch your hands. So he comes up. I need to see your driver's license and your insurance stuff. I said, yes, sir. Get it for him, honey. Hand it to him. Goes back to his car. He's back there, and he's back there, and he's back there. Well, first of all, before he went back, I said, <laughs> I used my traditional line, is something wrong? Is something wrong? I, I said, I think so. I said, what's wrong? He said, you're doing 70 in a 55. I said, oh, I thought it was 55. Well, you just passed the sign. Right, right there. He goes back to his car. He sits back there a while, and his time is turning. I said, man, what's he doing? In a minute, he walks back. He says, here's your license. Here's your insurance information. He said, I can't give you a ticket. Ignorant me. I said, why? <laughs> I should have said, thank you. I said, why? He said, well, you're a preacher, aren't you? And I said, I am. He said, well, my dispatcher back at headquarters recognized you. And she told him, said, I've been listening to that man preach since I was a little girl. He preaches camp meets, preaches all over the country. He said, if you give him a ticket, you will go to hell. He 
He handed me my license and my insurance and said, have a good day. The land is filled with them. We've got more power than we could imagine. Paul said this thing wasn't done in a corner. Apostolic Pentecostals are powerful. We are multiplying. The king said the land, they are fruitful. The king said they're increased abundantly. The king said they multiplied. The king said the land is full of them. The king said they are more and mightier than we. That was the appraisal of the new king. Now here's what I want to shock you with. I'm quickly going to move forward here. I'm not going to preach all night. I want you to hear this. Now this is what you need to really get a, to get a hold of. History supports the fact that Israel could have walked out of Egypt whenever they chose and the Egyptians could not have stopped them because they really were more and they really were more powerful than the Egyptians. The thing that held them there was their wrong concepts of themselves. They were limited though the lid had been removed. The small rope could never restrain them now. They insisted on floating when they could have fled to the deep water. They had developed a 70 and a slave mentality. Nothing could have held them there. The only thing that stopped them was their negative thinking. They refused to see themselves as they really were. We will shake our world if we will wake up to who we really are. I've come to tell you tonight, Pentecost, excuse the North Carolina language, but it's all I've got. Pentecost ain't 70 anymore. I know I should use aren't. We aren't 70. But that don't carry as good as we ain't 70. There may have been a day we were 70. We may have been a handful of people. We may have been on the back side of the tracks. What's happened is we have a brush harbor, storefront, back roads, small group, little weird people mentality. I don't know what kind of Pentecostal you are, but I'm going to tell you, I ain't a weird Pentecostal. There ain't nothing weird about truth. There ain't nothing wacky about truth. There ain't nothing off the wall about this great salvation. It may have been then, but that is not now. Quit living in the past. Turn around to somebody and say, come on up to the new millennium. The Bible said there's going to be a day that the whole earth is going to be filled with His glory. In the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. The glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former. The path of the just is a shining light. It's going to get brighter and brighter until the day of the Lord. This thing is not going to fizzle out. It's going to blast off. But somebody's got to see it that way. UPC does not stand for underprivileged children. UPC does not stand for undesirable Pentecostal church. Could I say it like this? The world's dying for what we've got. The world's overdosing because they can't find this. 
They're dying in alcoholism because they can't find this. They're overdosing in drugs because they can't find this. They're committing suicide because they can't find this. It's the greatest thing in the world. I wish somebody would jump up and shout, this is the greatest thing in the world. I'm a part of the greatest thing on earth. My concept of being a pastor is like being a coach. See, I coach the saints. And every Sunday morning, we play the devils. And we have prayer meeting every Saturday night. And before we leave, I get in the huddle. And I tell them, now this is what we're going to do tomorrow. And this is what's going to happen tomorrow. And I want you to be here ready to win this spiritual battle. Because it's going to be us against the devil. And when the lights go out, I intend to celebrate a victory. When we leave on Sunday morning, hell's going to be beat up. Somebody's going to be delivered. Somebody's going to be healed. Somebody's going to be forgiven. Somebody's going to be set free. And the devil's in the phone booth dialing 911. I'm at the end. I'd like to give you some hope. Musicians come and inspire the people and let the neighbors know we're not being held hostage here tonight. Numbers 13 tells of how Israel came to the borders of Canaan. And what kept them in Egypt almost kept them out of Canaan. The reason God calls them, oh, Lord, have mercy. The reason God calls them to wander 40 years in the wilderness is so that all the unbelievers would die. And he said, as soon as they're all dead, I'm going to take y'all in. God's serious about this thing called faith. Nothing will kill your walk with God more than unbelief. So 12 spies were sent in. and God didn't like that. Because you don't have to go scout what God has given you. They said, let's go see if we're able. Why do you need to go see if you're able if God said, I've given it to you? Ten of them came back. Now, here's a very unique moment in history. Opposite sides of the issue, diametrically opposed, contradicting responses. Ten said, we can't. They didn't. Two said, we can. They did. And generally, that's about the way it boils down. Those who believe they can, do. And those who think they can't, don't. Now, I know this is a, 
an astute, biblical, smart church I'm preaching to. If I ask you for one of the names of the two who said we can't, would you tell me who they are? You can't even say one of them. You've got to say both of them. Joshua and Caleb. Now, there was only two of them. But ten said we can't. Give me the name of one of the ten. Give me the name of one of the ten who said we can't. You know why nobody can? Who cares? You don't build monuments to people. We can't do that. You don't build monuments to people. We can't build a new church. We can't buy new property. We can't fill our church. We can't have revival. You don't name your kids after them, but there's a whole lot of Joshua's and Caleb's in Pentecost. If you want to be remembered, say we can. Now for a long time, I had not read this exactly right. I always said that 10 came back with a negative report. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible said 10 came back with an evil report. Evil. Evil. Everybody shout evil. Evil. Shout evil. Evil. To say that we can't is evil. (laughs) To be negative is to be evil. Now, I'm going to give you a profound lesson in the English language. It's going to be tough for you to follow, but I I think you can get it. When I get negative, I get evil. And I don't want to be evil because if you put a D in front of evil, you got devil. So when you get negative, you become evil and you are close to the devil. You are never closer to the devil than when your pastor says, we're going to have revival. And you say, oh, I, don't, I don't know about that. When he says, we're going to build a new church, you say, where are we going to get the money? When he says, we're going to double our youth group, and you say, well, we haven't done it up to now. When you become negative, you're evil. When you get evil, you're close to devil. Israel said we can't go in because there's strong people, walled cities, giants. And they even got so carried away, this is what they said. It's a land that eats up (laughs) the inhabitants. We're not going in there. Them weeds will choke us to death. Take weeds right up. I mean, their imaginations were running wild. The land is going to eat us up. If the giants don't get us, the land will. It, it will eat us up. Everybody say, Israel said. Strong people. Walled cities. Giants. A land that eats up the inhabitants. But what did God say? Hebrews 3.19, talking about the same thing. That's what Israel said, but here's what God said. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. God did not mention strong people, walled cities, giants, or a land that eats up the inhabitants. God said, no, 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 that didn't have anything to do with it. They couldn't go in because of unbelief. The only thing that's keeping you out of your promised land tonight is not money, buildings, or people. It's simple unbelief.
belief. People you thought never could or would be saved, would be saved. If you just jump to your feet tonight and start saying, I believe my husband's going to be saved. I believe my backsliders are coming back. I believe we're going to pack our church out. I believe our parking lot's going to be full. I believe people are going to be lined up to be baptized. I believe we're going to have to put out chairs. I believe people are going to get healed. I believe people are going to be delivered. Reach over and lay your hand on somebody right now and say, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke unbelief. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke unbelief. I'm going to step out of that aisle tonight and I'm going to believe that my miracle is on its way. My prayer is going to be answered. My touch is going to come. My blessing is about to overtake me. Somebody's got to believe it. Somebody's got to believe it. Turn around, shake somebody's hand and say, I agree with you. Whatever you need, God's going to do it. God's going to do it. You need to be healed? God's going to do it. You need the Holy Ghost? God's going to do it. You want a revival? God's going to do it. You want your church full? God's going to do it. You want miracle signs and wonders? Step out of the aisle and say, I believe it. I believe it. The only difference in those who could and those who didn't. The ones that could said we can. The ones that didn't said we can't. God is in this house tonight. And he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask or think. Take hands with somebody and say, I believe it. Somebody fought back. You need to step out of that aisle and overcome your unbelief. You need to start saying good things. You don't need to start saying powerful things. I believe God's going to intervene. I believe God's going to work. I believe God's going to answer. I believe God's going to bless. Lift your hands and say, God can do it. God can do it. God can do it. It doesn't matter what it is. God can do it. It doesn't matter how great it is. God can do it. 